And there are times when I found myself frustrated, like, why can't you just swallow? Why can't you just do this? I just wish for you, like, I think your happiness would be so much bigger, but you know, we all take it for granted. Every single one of us do until you're put in a position to where that it's not an option. And the ocean is where I need to be. When, when you can swallow, you have the luxury of wondering what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, how pissed off you are that there's traffic on the way to work, and why the dry cleaners charge so much money for a shirt. You get to wonder about all that when you can swallow. But when you can't swallow, all you get to think about is that you can't swallow. I will show you everything that you need to see. I didn't eat anything by mouth for six years. I could eat, then I couldn't eat, and I had to learn how to be in the world and not eat. So you go from, you know, grabbing an apple, salad, water, cheeseburger, whatever your thing is, you're just eating, and it just stops. Just like one day, it just stops. You have a can of, it looks like liquid plastic. And you're just seven times a day. Are you kidding? Really? Not only are you not eating, but you're not going out for coffee, you're not making breakfast, you're not shopping, you're not preparing food, you're not, it's over. It stops. For something that's this common, to be so under the radar or so underappreciated in the medical community, really attests to the embarrassment and the degree of disability that this disorder causes. And quite frankly, people are embarrassed to talk about it. People don't talk about dysphagia because they don't either know anybody and we don't see these people out and about. It's not like you, people with dysphagia can be walking around actually, in the, you know, doing errands but it's not like having a hemiplegia where you're not limping, you're not in a wheelchair necessarily. So it's not as visible. People have gastrostomy tubes that are underneath their clothes. So it's sort of a behind closed doors thing. If you're in rehab, you know people with swelling problems, if you're a therapist, but you don't see these people out in the community because people with tooth feedings aren't out there with their families in the restaurant. This is what the new normal was. You, know, you get up every morning and you know, you're on a tube and you've, you've got something hanging out of your stomach and, and you got to keep it clean and which is, you know, kind of unspeakable amongst people. But, you know, if it wasn't for the tube, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have nutrition. You know, they wouldn't, I'd be gone. And uh, so you need it. So it becomes a lifeline. Improvements in treatment of people with swallowing disorders are, are just not even on the map. You know, we now have a bionic eye that can allow blind people to see. We have a bionic ear that can allow deaf people to hear. All we want to do is take a sushi roll two centimeters safely from the throat into the esophagus. And it's just unacceptable to me that for such a mechanical problem that we don't have a mechanical solution. And this is something that affects people of all ages, young and old. And it's something, quite frankly, scares the hell out of me. There is one thing really frustrates me, and that is taking meals while well it's, it's just totally frustrating. So imagine what life would be like needing to take 20 minutes out of your life away from whatever it is you're doing just to take a sip of water. You can't imagine. That's a level of disability that you do not want to know about.
Ryder's three and a half years old. He had symptoms from the moment he was born. It was a very difficult birth, and as soon as we had him, they took him away, and he was in the hospital for six weeks before he came home. I would say it's half of my day, half of my waking hours are spent making sure he's fed properly, making sure his food is prepared properly, and making sure he's swallowing properly, make sure he's yeah. sitting in the correct position. Um, I would say, and I, I might even be underestimating, at least half of my waking hours would be spent nice. being concerned about his swallow safety and making sure everything's prepared in the correct manner. I'll do drums. I don't need a Oh, you don't need your guitar strap? Okay. His swallowing and just social functions, family functions, were huge in the beginning. It was almost debilitating in the beginning. We didn't even want to go out because of all of the equipment we had to bring with us, the throwing up. It, it, we didn't even want to go out of the house. It was so hard. Um, and just preparing, making sure that there was somebody there that could help me prepare it and with all of the feeding bags and all of the tubes. In the beginning, it was really tough. His grandmother does feed him sometimes, and she literally has a paper like this long that has step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. I mean, it's very listed out. Today, since he's not completely on the G-tube anymore, it's a little bit easier. People do still kind of stare like, why are you giving a child baby food? And, you know, I get those looks all the time, and. Um, I'm okay with it. I just, I'm, I'm really used to it at this point. He can eat anything that I grind up in a blender that make, that's made into baby food style. So he's three and a half and he's basically still eating baby food. He started feeding therapy when he was in the NICU and he's been going ever since. And we have um, feeding therapy once a week, we have speech therapy twice a week, and we see Jan twice a week in addition, and he has occupational therapy twice a week where they also work on oral motor stimulation, and he has physical therapy once a week. I don't, I, I don't think it's really one thing that has brought him there, I think it's the combination of everything that he does that has helped him get to this point. I really think it's a combination of everything that he's been doing for literally three and a half years. And we've never taken a break in therapy. People with dysphagia can be anywhere from newborns to geriatric patients, the whole entire age gamut. They can have swallowing problems because of head and neck cancer, because of things they're born with that are neurologic problems that cause weakness or spasticity or incoordination of movement. They can have acquired neurologic problems so they can get a stroke or a head injury. That can happen to children as well. Cancers that need to be treated by surgery where actually pieces are removed and or they have radiation that further affects the ability of structures to move and that gets worse over time. So just a, a plethora of causes or conditions that can create swallowing problems. I haven't been able to eat or drink for eight months. I've taken nothing by mouth since November 29th. As time went on, it was uh, very important to me that uh, I wanted to know when I was going to get over it and all this and that, and I didn't get any answers. It won't be a shock, it'll be a current that's running from this electrode to this electrode and back again. Okay. And the idea is to try and get a muscle contraction, to get the muscle to contract, to enhance the effect of swallow therapy. That's one thing that's frustrating to me, is that, you know, this happened way back in November, and I'm just now starting the therapy on swallowing. It seems like it could have started a lot earlier. And that's what, that's what I would have really liked to put the pressure on earlier to start the, the therapy on the swallowing. The thin stuff is, go, is going down the wrong way when you go to swallow. This is a little better with your chin down but we don't want to see anything go down the front. We want to see it all go down the back. All right, 
That's what you got. Oh, okay. Yeah, that'll be good. What bothers me the most about not being able to swallow is that I just would like the freedom of being able to help myself to anything that I want. Living with a feeding tube really is, is very disturbing to me, and I don't like uh, eating that way. It's not a, it's not a situation, I really don't want to live like that. Big swallow. No other way. I want to eat and drink and be merry. The why me, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to us? I can't tell you how many times I thought that. And I can't tell you how many times I've cried over it. Show it to dad. Tell him what it is. So. <gasps> what shape is that? An octagon. An octagon? Who's the smartest little kid? Me. Yeah. Once we're done with this, I might be able to rest a little bit and take a deep breath and, and not, you know, think about why us, why him, you know, why does he have to deal with this and then move on from there. If he grows out of this, if and when he grows out of this, because I'm very optimistic, he just keeps improving and keeps getting better. So I really feel like this is gonna get better but I still continually think about it. And I don't know if it'll ever go away. I would just get in a loop of frustration and anger and rage, which sounds not very attractive, but it's true. I mean, I just felt like I guess it's like feeling sorry maybe for yourself sometimes. I would just get in that moment where I just thought, I can't be strong, I can't be positive, I can't be hopeful, I can't be, you know, uh, bigger than this, I can't make meaning out of this. I don't care. I just think something really bad happened to me and I hate it. I thought there's got to be a second chapter, and I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what my recovery is going to look like. I don't know if I'll ever swallow again, but this story has got to have a different ending. And I remember the first time I, I was in public and I could eat something. I mean, people were walking around, there were benches, and there was a cafe, and I think I got, I don't know, a muffin or something. And I remember it was kind of crowded, and there were people. And I sat on this bench, and I was like in public, in the daylight. Not alone, not in my kitchen, not spitting in a cup, not pining for food at a table with friends eating. I had food, and I was in public. But yet, I was anonymous. I took like this really teeny bite and I had this straw guzzling down. But I thought I'm in the world. It was like a moment where I thought I'm I'm back. Back into the world. People are suffering and people are brave and they're not suffering in vain. You know, they're suffering in a valiant attempt to have some dignity and some meaning to a life that's been radically altered.